Press pause and answer the question. This one's kind of a tricky one until you remember what natural numbers and integers and rational numbers and real numbers and complex numbers and imaginary numbers and all of these things are. And so we're going to work on that a little bit. But if A and B are both rational numbers, to which sets must A B belong? And the choices are natural numbers, integers, rational numbers, real numbers, or complex numbers. And the answer is this one, that it's going to be that a b is going to be a times b is going to be a rational number it's going to be a real number and it's going to be a complex number and to keep track of these this is kind of how i want to work it out we're going to do it graphically but before we do let's talk about a game it's a lottery game it's in great britain so the british lottery in 2007 they introduced something called the cool cash game actually the name of the company, uh, the lottery company, is called Camelot, right? So this British company called Camelot introduced a lottery, and it was a scratch-off game. So they had two numbers on each card. One number was on the card, and the other one had a window that you'd scratch off, and each number was a temperature. So it had kind of a winter theme, and of course it was in Celsius. So anything below freezing was a negative number. So there were a lot of negative numbers on this. And the way it worked is if the number that was scratched off was below the temperature that was printed on the card, so you'd scratch one off. If it was below the number that was printed on the card, you won. But this caused confusion. I shouldn't laugh. But this caused confusion with a subset of the population of the participants in the lottery because some of them believe that negative 2 must be a larger number than negative 1. So you know that negative 2 is a smaller number than negative 1, even though 2 is larger than 1. So Tina, who's a 23-year-old who thought she won the lottery but didn't, she said this to a reporter. She said, I phoned Camelot, and they fobbed me off with some story that negative 6 is higher, not lower, than negative 8. But I'm not having it. I think Camelot are giving people the wrong impression. 6 is a lower number than 8. Imagine how many people have been misled. Well, there were a lot of people who were misled. There's no one more upset than someone who thinks they won the lottery but then didn't. So negative numbers, this kind of seems ridiculous, right? You know that negative 8 is lower than negative 6, but it's not totally intuitive. And in fact, the whole idea of the even existence of negative numbers was fairly controversial, especially in Europe, not that long ago. I mean, we've had math for a long time, but we really haven't had negative numbers in math in the European tradition anyway for very long because a lot of the European tradition came from our Greek and Egyptian and Babylonian uncles. And they were the progenitors of a lot of our math, and they didn't have negative numbers. I should add that some ancient Asian cultures did. China did, India did. But if we're talking about in Europe, even into the 1700s, Europeans just had a hard time conceptualizing them because numbers were generally used for counting. Math was about counting. It was about counting mainly and about geometry sometimes. So if I have four urns that I've made and I give you one urn, we can just go four minus one equals three. I have three urns left. I had four, I gave one away, now I have three. If I have four urns and give you five urns, then I have four minus five, which is negative one. And how can I have negative one urn? I cannot have negative one urn. Now, accountants can kind of think like this. And accounting, within the accounting world, eventually they became, the accountants became comfortable with negative numbers, but not so much for the mathematicians. So the accountants kind of were working with negative numbers because I may owe you an urn, for instance, but mathematicians still were very suspicious of it. And then in like 1685, there was an English mathematician and his name was John Wallace. And he came up with kind of is the killer app and something I'm fond of because I'm all about conceptualizing math and doing it graphically. And he came up with a killer app to conceptualize negative numbers. And that killer app, of course, is the number line. And on the number line, you probably might even been picturing that in your head like I was. When I was reading that negative eight is lower than negative six, but she thought that negative six was lower than negative eight, you were thinking about it on the number line, that zero is here and negative six is here, negative eight's there, so negative eight is lower than negative six. So that idea that numbers can be 
better understood graphically. That's actually the basis for this whole project that you're watching and listening to. It's kind of what got me interested in this because I have an architecture degree and I have a math degree and I've been tutoring math and I've been making animations in architecture and I thought, you know, this is really how math ought to be taught. It ought to be taught visually. So even over a century after Wallace, so even once they came up with the number line, there was still skepticism. One book by a pretty respected mathematician called Negative Numbers, quote, a jargon from which common sense recoils. So it just didn't seem commonsensical to have a negative number. And he added that those who support the concept of negative numbers, those who are in favor of negative numbers, are enemies of serious thought. So it's pretty harsh words for the 1700s. And if it wasn't hard enough up until then to conceptualize negative numbers, someone started fussing around with the equation x squared equals negative 1, right? So if you take the square root of both sides, you get x equals the square root of negative 1, but that doesn't make any sense because a positive times a positive is a positive, and negative times a negative is a positive. And so how do you multiply something times itself and get negative 1? And among the first that we know of to start grappling with that was the Italian mathematician Girolamo Cardano. And he started thinking about it, but not too long, because he said it caused him mental tortures, in his words. So he ignored it. He said, we can't deal with it, and it's useless even if we could. And finally, the very accomplished Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler gave that value, this kind of the idea of the square root of negative one. He just gave it its own placeholder, and he called it I. And he named all the square roots of negative numbers, all the things that don't kind of work out, he named them imaginary. And then we start calling, if we have A plus BI, so if we have like three plus two I, we call that a complex number. So if we just have two I, it's an imaginary number. It's also a complex number because it's zero plus two I. But if we have a number plus something times I, we call that a complex number. Now, originally, uh, the idea of I, that Euler's I, the idea of this kind of placeholder, and probably your experience in math in high school, is thought as just kind of a convenient way of solving math equations that require some kind of a logical twist. So if, if it just doesn't make any sense to take the square root of negative 1, let's just make that I and then solve it anyway so at least we kind of can get through it. But we've since come up with pretty complex, but kind of useful. They're actually quite useful uh, ways of using I, and not in kind of a perfunctory way where we're just trying to give it a job. But actually, it's really, really good at describing things that rotate. And it's really useful in particle physics and radar and all kinds of parts of electrical engineering, especially the higher order parts of electrical engineering. So if we look at all of our types of numbers, we can remember it by the initialism C-R-R-I-W-N, or Chris's Red Raisins Interested Will's Neighbor. So let's go through them. The C is complex. So complex numbers include things like 3i, or 2i root 2, or 4 plus 2i. That's kind of the quintessential complex number. But it also includes things like negative 4, and negative root 2, and 0, and square root of 5, and 7 thirds, and pi, and 8. So pretty much all numbers that we can imagine are complex numbers. They may or may not have an i in them, because you can always have a 0 before the i and just make it go away. But just about everything is complex numbers. Now, a subset of those are real numbers. And real numbers don't have the imaginary parts in them. So there's no i's. So these kind of carry over to here. So real numbers can be negative 4, negative root 2, 0, square root of 5, 7 thirds, pi, or 8. So numbers like negative 4 and 0 and 8 are pretty straightforward. Numbers like 7 thirds are still pretty straightforward, just 7 divided by 3. Numbers like the square root of 2 or the square root of 5 or pi, those are much more difficult to get your head around because you can't make them into clean fractions. You can't take a clean fraction and make pi or make the square root of 5. And so for the things that you can make a clean fraction with, numbers like negative 4 and 0 and 7 thirds and 8, we'll take those down and we'll put them in a subset of real numbers called rational numbers. 
called rational numbers. Not to be confused with irrational numbers. Irrational numbers are ones that can't be ratios. You see rational and ratio. So negative four is a ratio. It's negative four to one. And zero is a ratio. It's zero to two. And seven thirds is a ratio. It's seven to three. And eight is a ratio. It's 16 to two. We can describe those as ratios, but we can't describe negative the square root of two as a fraction or ratio. And we can't describe the square root of five or pi as fractions or ratios. So those are called irrational numbers. So within real numbers, uh, we have two categories. One category are called rational numbers, and one category are called irrational numbers. Now within the rational numbers, we have another subcategory called integers, and you probably knew what those were. That includes numbers like negative four and zero and eight, but it does not include fractions things that are in between integers, things like one-half or one-third or 21-fourths. Within integers, we have what are called whole numbers. And whole numbers are integers. We just throw out the negative numbers. So we take in 0 and we take in 8 in the subset of whole numbers, but we eliminate the negative numbers. And then within whole numbers, we have a subset called natural numbers. Those are the positive integers, the positive whole numbers. Basically, we're just taking out zero. So a natural number is one, two, three, four, five. There are counting numbers. So when you count how many fingers are on a hand or how many hairs are on a square inch of scalp, we're talking about natural numbers. I guess that's not totally true. You could be bald, in which case you have zero hairs on your scalp. But let's just assume you have some hair. Those are natural numbers. All right. Now, one thing I haven't covered yet are imaginary numbers. And as I mentioned before, imaginary numbers are the subset of complex numbers where we have an i involved. So we have 3i or 2i root 2, where we have something imaginary. And that's a subset of complex numbers that falls outside of the realm of real numbers. So to recap, we have complex numbers, which is pretty much every number we can think of, including the ones that are combinations of a plus bi. And within that, we have real numbers and imaginary numbers. The real numbers are kind of all the numbers that seem real, <laughs> that don't, have, don't involve square root of negative 1 somewhere involved in it. And within the real numbers, we have two categories. We have rational numbers, and we have irrational numbers. And the rational numbers are ones that we can make clean fractions of. And the irrational ones are kind of weird square roots or pi or e or things like that, uh, things that are really hard to make into a, a clean fraction. Within the rational numbers, we have integers. Those are, those are the uh, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. And within the integers, we have whole numbers. And in that case, we're throwing out the negative integers. And within the whole numbers, we'll have the natural numbers. And in that case, we're just throwing out the zeros. All right. So we have C, R, R, I, W, N. So just taking out the imaginary and the irrational numbers for a minute, just going from the, you know, kind of a line through here where we have complex to real to rational to integers to whole to natural numbers, we can remember that with the uh, mnemonic device, Chris's Red Raisins Interested Will's Neighbor. Now, if you're saying that is a really bad phrase to memorize, I agree. And if you can come up with a better one, I would love to hear it. I will come back in this recording studio. I will record a new mnemonic device, so send it to me. But for the meantime, that's the best I can come up with. Chris's Red Raisins Interested Will's Neighbor. Complex, real, rational, integers, whole, natural. So back to our actual question, if you still remember it. The question is, if A and B are both rational numbers, to which set must AB belong? So if they're rational numbers, that means they're ratios. That means that they're fractions, clean fractions. So A and B could be numbers like 7 thirds and 3 halves. And if you multiply any two rational numbers, you're going to get another rational number, right? Because you can multiply the two numerators and you can multiply the two denominators and then you get another ratio, another clean fraction. And all rational numbers are also real numbers. And all real numbers are also in the subset of complex numbers. So anything that's rational is automatically real and complex. 
So these three are all true, and so this is the correct answer.